Okay, we're back rolling, so I'll call the meeting uh, back to order. Um, we're, we're all on a little bit of a time crunch, so I don't want to keep you people here longer than you should, and, and uh, so we'll get uh, started. And uh, so Gus, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you and well, we'll run around the room and introduce ourselves to the old uh, Yep, Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Billy Runner, Chittenden in North, including Fairbanks. Brian Campion, in the Bennington County District. And Bobby Starr from Orleans County. Rich Westman should be right along from mm -hmm. Memorial. So, uh, that's your good comb is. It's, Before you get on camera, I just want to it, it's I'm good. Gonna, I'm going to be a mess no matter what. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, Gus, I'll turn it over to you and uh, we'll get started. And, and, uh, and I'm going to ask Tracy to join me right to the get go if that's okay. Sure. Uh, you, can have, you can have two chairs up there or, or okay. four if you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you move up on the corner. Oh, it's okay. Plenty of space. Yeah, good morning, Tracy. Good morning, nice to see you. Say, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, by way of introduction, uh, for the record, I've got Celia, director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and with me uh, is my longtime colleague, collaborator, and now interim mm -hmm. president of the Vermont Land Trust, Tracy Chow. Ah, congratulations. With her. And joining us also is Liz Gleason, who's the director of the Farm and Forest Viability Program. And also in the room is our policy director, um, Polly Major, who you've met before. Yeah. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be in this room uh, with you, Senator Starr, and with Senator Westman, is really the people who initiated our program all those years ago. Um, we understand you wanted to talk specifically about how do we help young farmers get access to farmland. So I hope I have that right. Yeah, and, uh, yeah we've had quite a few questions yeah. so far, even this year, uh, uh, about yeah. getting into the business and how rough it is. So. Yes, and it, and it is rough. I do, um, and we'll get into this more, uh, but I'm gonna, we're going to talk about challenges and opportunities, what tools we use, including something called an option to purchase at ag value, which we began to use the first 12 or 13 years of our program when we bought development rights from farmers. We just had a right of first refusal when they were ready to sell it. And then in the early 2000s, we added this option to purchase at ag value. And so now a majority of the easements that are publicly funded have that on it. Um, and it's a tool that Trace will talk about more later, but it's intended not to be utilized, but to discourage non-farm buyers from buying farms. Um, and we will support and have supported lots of young farmers who don't have 50% of their income coming from agriculture get started. But when a Bill Gates shows up or a doctor from Philadelphia who wants to buy a retirement farm at a discounted price, yep. we have a tool that basically says, what's your plan for farm? And we vet it. And so if somebody's not a farmer, we have the ability to say, no, we're not going to choose you. But we don't have a that's the point at which we look at whether somebody is really serious about agriculture or they're looking for a retirement home and a hobby farm. So we can talk about that more later on. And I apologize for the confusion about it. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk in great length about our other programs, but to say, uh, in addition to purchasing development rights, um, we developed the Farm and Forest Viability Program many years ago, about 20, a little over 20 years ago, um, to support farmers to build more capacity for people to be in agriculture. And you asked us to stand up the Rural Economic Development Initiative about five years ago. And I think it's now uh, helped 21 folks get wind value added producer grants. Is that the right number, Liz? Um, it might be a little bit less than that, but certainly over the course of the Farm Viability Program has been at least 20. So that's the grant writing support that we give to people in rural communities <coughs> go after federal funds that are not easy to get. That, uh, that's been quite a program. Yeah. How many uh, million do you know what that's we've, we've spent a half million dollars and it's brought in over $10 million mm -hmm. so far. 
on. So pretty good return on loss. Pretty good return. Your institutions committee gives us a water quality program to manage, which is often used by farmers either to participate in DMP or in um, equip um, and help leverage that money as well. And then finally, and I think you heard from some of the advocates for the Land Access and Opportunity Board, that's a program that was initiated, a new board that was initiated last year, and you asked the HCB to be the home for it. And they particularly want to tackle the challenge of helping marginalized communities come into farm ownership and come into home ownership. Uh, the picture you see here is a farm where we, in Randolph, where we bought development rights, I think probably in the late 90s. Um, it's operated for more than 20 years by the Bidlers, and they've since sold it. And the way the transfer was arranged was to add a retroactive option to purchase at ag value to their easement. And that gave, that lowered the price by about $240,000 to incoming farmers by adding that to it. So while we, in new easements, we always put this option on when an old farm comes up and wants, needs to be transferred, we sometimes add it, and it adds a financial a way to make the farm more affordable. Uh, and we'll talk about that more as we go through the slideshow, but that's a farm in Randolph that's benefited from adding that option. Um, these are all uh, farms in the last couple years that have been the subject of buying development rights and transferring, and I think Liz and the viability program has also worked with uh, some of the landowners, and Tracy, you may want to, you, you will know more than I do about any of these, so if you want to jump in. Um, not on these specifically, I no. think we'll hit them okay. as we go. Okay, hit them as yeah. we go. Yeah. But the one in Rockingham is on the Williams River, and that was actually transferred from grandparents mm -hmm. to grandson. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll talk in a few minutes, we'll show you a slide about how much it's reducing overall cost uh, compared with full value. Um, briefly, um, we are matching dollar for dollar with development rights, um, a federal program every year. And next year, through the Inflation Reduction Act, we're told that will actually be much more than $3 million available if we can find the match. Um, we provide support to organizations, and we'll show you a slide of all the organizations that are working on farm transfers that includes the Intervale Center. And UVM Extension, a group called Land for Good, uh, as we move <coughs> through. Um, but the picture of the Schwinger farm is one I've, I've shown you a different picture in the past of what that farm looked like when Guy's dad owned it in 1999. Um, and when Guy took over, knowing the development rights were gone, he basically said, I need to, my number one value is soil health. And he has been an all star NRCS cooperator, and this year we nominated him for the New England all those Leopold Award, which he won, which actually came with a cash prize. Uh, and his plan is to transfer the farm. Uh, he took the farm organic. Uh, we helped him through development rights by a neighboring farm a few years back. Uh, and his plan is for his son, Matt, who's very active in the farm, to take it on as, as his farm in a few that years. That guy not been in high I mean, or? Yeah. Um, Tracy's numbers are a little, going to be a little different than the ones I'm showing you uh, because the Vermont Land Trust with philanthropic funds has conserved more farmland and more farms than we have. So these are the numbers with public funds or private investment, but there's some that have just been conserved with private funds. About four out of 10 deals now have been specifically around the issue of, uh, uh, of farm transfers right now. Others are anticipating a transfer sometime in the future. And I know that at least two of members of the committee worked for many years um, with Sam Burr when he was in Ledge Council, and so he's somebody whose farm was conserved back in the 90s. He actually carved off a piece that uh, Habitat and others built some housing on, uh, and he's in the midst of transferring to his son Silas. Um, so this chart is just showing you what the before about the blue lines are, what farms on average are going for as they're appraised. And the yellow line, uh, excuse me, that orange bar is showing you what the value is after you've bought the development rights. And so through the pandemic, uh, the value, the development value has gone up. 
Um, we left one farm out of this as an outlier, but that was, that's a farm in Stowe that uh, Senator Westman will know, the Rickardson farm. Mm -hmm. And what happened there in the pandemic, just to speak to the where our real estate market is, is NRCS requires that if an appraisal is more than a year old, we have to do a new appraisal. So, and I've never met Kenny. I'm sure you know him. Um, a little. He's a very shy man. I know his sister. Uh, but it, the appraisal got to be more than 12 months old. We needed to do a new appraisal. When the new appraisal came up out 15 months later, the value of the development rates had gone up a million dollars. A million dollars? Yeah, now the Stowe Land Trust did a huge amount of fundraising, and a man who spent his life with cows made the biggest bargain sale that our organization's ever been a part of as well. Um, I think he's happy with his retirement, his sister tells me. But um, that just speaks to the pressures in the real estate markets. Stowe is an outlier, but in general, what you're seeing here is that real estate values in all parts of Vermont are going up and going up dramatically. Um, this is a slide Tracy's organization put together, but it just speaks to all the people, all the organizations that are working on the question of land access. And with the large inventory of conserved land that either has a right of first refusal or an option to purchase it at value on it, um, they are often candidates for helping young farmers get onto farms. Uh, but and the viability program is a funder, as I said a moment ago, of NOFA Vermont, UVM Extension, the Center for Ag Economy, and the Interrail Center, um, along with Land for Good, which specifically works on farm transfers. Um, so they are a funder of all that work. We also provide a specific grant, but it's not the only funding. And the Vermont Land Trust has just done an incredible job of raising money to be focused on uh, transferring land from one farm to the next, which Tracy will talk about more in a minute. And Madam President. <laughs> well, um, thank you um, for, for having us here today. I really appreciate um, the time and the interest um, in, in our work. And again, my name is Tracy Shao, and I have actually worked for Vermont Ventures for 25 years. Spent a bunch of that time running the roads in the Northeast Kingdom as project director there, developing conservation projects with farmers and forest land owners and communities, and have been working in statewide. Um, leadership position since about 2014 um, and now serving as interim president as well as vice president for land conservation. Um, I know that um, I think VLT has already been in the room. Um, so colleagues of mine, Abby and Al, I think we're here. Um, so I will just, you know, quick touch point to the mission of VLT and our work to unite land and lives through land conservation um, in recent, and that's through largely conservation easement, work on private lands, farms, forests, and community lands. Um, in recent years, um, also focused on uh, land acquisition by community groups, municipalities, the state, um, and also restoration, education, um, and equity as um, places to invest more deeply to really maximize our impact on the land and really um, ensure that the promise of land conservation for everyone in the state is, is met. Um, and just for some numbers, um, we've been around since 1977. At this point, um, helped to conserve about 11% of the state, over 620,000 acres. We steward um, over 2,300 easements at this point, and I think it's safe to say that that is one of the largest stewardship portfolios in the country um, by easement numbers in yeah, one of the smallest states. Um, so uh, a lot of experience now with, with easement stewardship and um, have 46 uh, staff statewide. Um, just to drill down a little bit more into our farmland protection work, as Gus noted, our numbers are a little different because um, we pre-existed the HDB by a few years and we also have used other funding mechanisms to augment the state's very significant investment in in land conservation. So this is a word that I, have, I struggle with, but we, we to hopped the one thousandth. <laughs> That's the I, I get tripped up, but we went. We passed the one thousand mark on farms conserved in the state in twenty twenty two. It was actually the Ricketts and Farm and Stowe that was wow. our one thousandth farm mm -hmm. that um, that we have conserved. Um, that covers about two hundred sixteen thousand acres and um, protecting about twelve percent of Vermont's ag soils. 
Um, in that conservation work, um, we have directly supported over 100, I think the number is like 115 now, successful transfers of farmland. A lot more conserved farmland is transferring, but our direct <laughs> involvement, and we'll talk about those strategies today, has been supporting about 115. Is that from uh, VLT's original farm owners to new farm owners, or is that regular farm owners <clears throat> switching to? It's a both. Both. Yeah, and we'll talk about it. That's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is those different strategies that yeah. farmland access getting. Um, folks on to actually, you know, um, you know, the goal of securing access to affordable farmland, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to get at that and a lot of strategies um, necessary because there's there's a lot of challenges and I think you heard you've heard of, of some of the challenges and it had direct testimony to those challenges. We um, heard we hear it all. Um, yeah, and so I think I think some of the examples that we're going to bring will show the different ways and so when we say. VLT has helped um, support 115 transfers. Those have been through the examples we're going to provide of using conservation easement purchases at the time of transfer to bring down the purchase price of farms, to look back at the conserved lands portfolio and make additional investments to again bring down the purchase price, and then also to um, directly play a role in land ownership and on an interim basis. Um, to also help to transfer farms. So some have passed through our ownership, many have not. Um, and, and then just the really strong partnership with um, farm and forest viability is a key, um, a key aspect. Um, I, I actually remember two thirds of, our, of that 115 farm transfers have been direct easement, easement purchases mostly with VHCB in, in support of a transfer at the time and really fueling a transfer, and about a third have been through another mechanism, um, either our ownership or, um, the, again, the stewardship portfolio and the retro vocab, which we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper into. Anything to add to that? Cool. Nothing else. Those are the um, I, I'm happy to add a little on Palm Valley. Um, we'll go back to the picture. Yeah, great photo, uh, really reflective of this time of year, I think. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is a great example of a farm that we worked on together um, through VLT's Farmland Access Program, VHCB's Conservation Easement Dollars, and the Farm and Forest Viability Program. Um, sometimes all those things happen at different times, and sometimes they all need to happen at the same time. And it can be quite complex to work through different scenarios. So um, Full Valley worked with us on a business plan to access the land. Um, they had been farming elsewhere and were really looking to buy their own place and expand. And an existing farm was getting out and looking for new owners who would continue the really excellent operation that they had built up. So um, a really great success story. They grow a lot of strawberries, veggies, um, and a great example of, of beginning farmers who are able to access land. This is in Moncton. We just wanted to kind of set up um, a bit around the challenges and the opportunities ahead of kind of talking about what's the toolbox that we've been employing to get um, folks affordably on onto farmland, um, recognizing that there, there are a lot of challenges around the availability, the timing of the real estate market, the challenges of the real estate market uh, in, in terms of um, farmers needing to compete both from a financial standpoint but also a timing standpoint with other buyers and being able to be prepared to be in service to that. The affordability challenge, the slide earlier about the escalation in land values um, and the challenges. Um, business viability, and Liz can talk about this more, but being able to have a business that can afford to own land and operate um, and the, the connection between, between the two. Um, 
different ways to have security on land, whether that's through fee ownership or durable leases, or we'll talk a bit about some of the alternative tenure and ownership models that folks are working on as um, an answer to different ways to own to own land um, collectively. Um, and then equity, just recognizing the structural barriers that members of the of, um, of marginalized communities face um, that are above and beyond those that may um, be entering with more of a leg up from um, either their circumstances, their legacy with, of land ownership, and really trying to, to think um, differently about the tools so that everybody um, is, um, has, has opportunity. <clears throat> this morning, <clears throat> this morning I was meeting uh, with an individual in regards to our sustainable food supply <clears throat> in from the northeast region, and um, they estimate that in New England we need, if we were going to sustain our own food supply. Um, including me, it would take a, a million acres of crop land and basically in New England it's got to, the bulk of that's got to come either out of Maine or Vermont. Uh, so it's a good thing we're keeping our farmland, How much? farmland in. What, what is the total? Yeah, I was going to ask that too. What are the totals right now? <coughs> of the, what we're using? Yeah, yeah of how much ag land there is. Um, it's about 30% uh, is in Vermont is being used to meet our food supply. But we're only meeting 30, at the most 30% of that. It could, it should be a lot more. And then, yeah, just listening, sort of, you know, as we think about the tools, how they're supporting new and beginning farmers and <coughs> their interest in getting onto farms and the partnerships that we need, um, as well as the new partnerships um, and new and new and different tools that we'll delve into. Just a, a story to sort of illustrate some of those challenges and opportunities. I think the equity piece is interesting. Um, and both, sorry, I'm actually reading this as equity in terms of like financial equity, not societal but equity. Both, uh, both are yeah. <laughs> challenges, but the example of um, you know young farmers who want to get into farming, many of whom would have been working on farms as employees, as family members, some of whom who have been doing it in a volunteer capacity, people who are really engaged in the food system but not farming. Like, there's not a lot of opportunity to build a down payment, um, to build any equity in any business that you're <coughs> part of, uh, such that when you go to purchase your own land, there's there's not a lot there. Um, and I think that slide on the easement value compared to the um, purchase value of those huge differences in that bar graph um, really shows both like how incredibly critical a tool of conservation easement is for new and beginning farmers, particularly. Um, and how it can really be one thing that addresses that financial equity piece. Uh, that being said, if you're still looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's, um, you know, what is that, like a $2,000 and $3,000 a month loan payment um, back when interest rates were like 3 or 4%, much higher now. So when you look at like a monthly basis for young farmers, people without a lot of money, it's really significant even at that price point. And, I think like a beautiful tool, a really needed tool, um, doesn't erase some of the financial hardships of agriculture. I think it speaks to the business viability partnerships and helping farmers you know, build build a business that can sustain that sort of debt and be successful because just getting on the land won't, won't isn't isn't enough. And that's where the wraparound services and that you know. <coughs> Um, diagram showing all the partners is so critical, and I think we're from is, you know, working hard to, to really fully support. Um. And how many, how many acres does it take um, for a, a person starting out, uh, like growing vegetables, 
uh, to be able to meet their mortgage and has that ever been figured out? It uh, really depends on the, on the crop that they're growing, on you know what kind of debt they might have. Um, debt load is like one of the biggest indicators of future business viability. The lower your debt, the more opportunity you have to succeed and reinvest in your business and not be sort of thrown aside by um, big risks. Uh, but we see like, <coughs> diversified direct to market vegetable producers, like you can get started on an acre if it's really good land and mm -hmm. you're managing really intensively. But that doesn't give you room to rotate your right. crops, it doesn't give you room for a farm stand. Generally you need actually quite a bit more space than an acre. For, for a dairy or a beef farm it's, um, you know, got to be more like 100 and why, why I asked that question is we had uh, Commissioner Fish and Game in a week or two ago, and they have uh, crop damage from deer, right? Yep. And <clears throat> this vegetable grower, and he said it's all been checked and double checked and verified, but they had. Uh, three different plots that the deer went in and ate the veggies. It's over $200,000 uh, in damages that, of course, they have to cover it. And so we've been looking into that, but it didn't sound like it was a great big farm, like no. 200 acres. It was. Uh, a small operation, but had over two hundred thousand dollars in damages. And, uh, so it doesn't take a big lot of land to grow a lot of high value food. Yeah. You want to move it along? Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know. Oh, that's yours. Yeah. Any, anything else you want I know to say? her. No. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I'll speak a little bit about the Farm and Forest Viability Program, which was started at BHCB 20 years ago. Um, so far we've worked with over 900 farm, food, and forest products businesses. We added the forest part about 10 years ago, right around when the Working Man's Enterprise Board was also starting. Um, it was, you know, we were part of a statewide effort to really recognize both the farm and the forest and how those working landscapes are important and tied together. Um, so we began working with forest products businesses then as well. Um, I'd say, you know, we made this slide a couple months ago. It might be a little closer to just under a thousand at this point. <laughs> um, I'll have to keep track of our thousand. <laughs> and practicing <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, in 2022, we worked with 154 different kinds of businesses. Um, and when you put all those folks together, all different um, kinds of production from dairy to livestock to vegetable to produce um, to value added to forestry, uh, ranging in scale from that really small scale to um, occasionally we even work with LFOs, um, it, it can result in a lot of jobs. So over 450 jobs and almost 35 million represented by that group of people. And, um, just to highlight that transfer planning aspect and um, both you know within families and outside of families we are sort of in a period of heightened transfers we knew it was coming we know that average age of farm and forest business owners is nearing retirement um, and that we the, the current period we're in is a heightened period of generational transfer um, about a third of the people we work with in any given year are at some point in considering that transfer, whether it's starting to plan for it or actively going through it. Um, some of the impacts from the program, we, we see a lot of people enter this program to help um, grow their business uh, and, and particularly increase their take home net income. Um, last year, I think we had about 13 people who entered the program losing money with their business and nine of those 13 exited the program having moved into profitability. So we work with people who are both really kind of struggling to make that work and figuring it out, and people who are at a different, more mature stage of their business. It's really all over the place. And 
Um, you know, these are some economic impacts, access to almost $3 million in loans and grants, 70% um, increased sales, but the sort of softer side I think is even more important and people see increased satisfaction with their business and their ability to generate income for their family from their business um, and increased satisfaction with work-life balance, which uh, we consider to be one of the biggest points of this program. Sometimes people enter and they're like, my goal is to figure out how to take one day off a week. <laughs> um, and that's a major metric of success. Um, I also just want to say that with the one-time funding in FY22 and 23 from the legislature, the viability program has been able to grow really significantly. We hired an additional two, almost uh, two full-time farm and forest business advisors who are housed at the Intervale Center and UDM Extension. So now we have um, like 16 or 17 people engaged. That's not all people full-time, but it's several of them are including those new positions that were added as a result of the one-time funding so and I should say last year <coughs> for those yeah. of you on the appropriations committee you increased our base funding and we increased the viability programs budget we basically doubled it to two from a million to two million dollars the governor's budget um, seeks to reverse that the house the budget we get from the house maintains it but our ability to continue at the level we're currently at depends on a larger base budget rather than one type of funding. So, in the house, put that in. The house put it back to what you did last year, uh, increasing our base. So well, that's that really important. For makes us. it easier on this side. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you hear that, Wes? Yep, I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just. Lisa McDougall, uh, pictured here, is a great success story from the perspective. She was leasing land in Powell for, I think, a decade before she was able to buy the farm. Was it that farm? Um, that VLT made available through the Farmland Access Program. You, you want to talk about how that process works a little bit? Yeah, so Farmland Access at Vermont Land Trust, we have a Farmland Access Director, Maggie Donan, um, but really our Farmland Access antenna is up across the organization and both the folks that work on new conservation opportunities as well as our stewards who have deep relationships with the conserved lands um, and the conserved farms, um, over a thousand of them, also always looking for opportunities to, to match make, to um, look for farms where the timing of a conservation easement sale could help bridge uh, and, and create a transfer opportunity. We also occasionally um, get more deeply involved in the matchmaking in terms of recruiting requests for proposals from farmers and more directly connect um, farmers with new land opportunities. Sometimes we are in ownership of those, sometimes we're not. Um, and um, yeah, Lisa McDougall and the opportunity to help her land on her permanent farm situation is a great example of that, uh, that work. When, when a farmer sells their, wants to get out and sell their property, um, and a young person, of course, would like to purchase it, do they, do the, the farmer selling like to get all their money, half their money, uh, you know, because of tax purposes, or are they any any of, any of them willing to spread it out over a given period of time? Or it's a great question. It, I think the transition planning work kind of helps landowners figure out what their needs are. Yeah, yeah, it can be very different in terms of whether there's the opportunity to, and whether it's a family transfer. You know, sometimes those are harder or easier, I think, depending on the family dynamics. But in some cases, you know, there's that ability to spread out a sale or bring someone into ownership. Um, when it's two parties that don't know each other, you know, giving them the support to think about those different options and the financial needs. Yeah, right. What has become more and more difficult for small farmers and um, young people um, to make the transfer and do the transfer. I don't think we ever imagined um, 25 or 30 years ago as we put this together that farmland itself would be assessed and um, people would be paying the values they're paying now. Mm -hmm. um, and to when it's 
a minimum of $3,500 an acre in um, you know, a town like mine for um, the farm portion not the develop, you know, the development rights are gone. Um, it's very hard for anybody new to come in. Yeah. That's a, that's a fair mm -hmm. criticism mm -hmm. and, and it, it's not meant to be a criticism. No, no, but yeah, it's, it's a reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. reality that yeah. we're all having yeah. with yeah. And, <clears throat> and it's, I don't know if we've figured out the solutions to, to oh, every no. piece of the problem. Is. I'm sure we haven't. But I know that we want to work hard to figure it out. And some of it may be, you know, you've put a lot of work into what is now VitaVec, and some of it is how do people finance their operations, what's their operation going to be. Um, but clearly, um, it's a bigger challenge. And the more valuable the land, the more there needs to be, whether it's philanthropic help or private room private resources or public resources, we need to work at that. And you might want to just begin to talk and about the various I, And tools. I would say, God forbid, if it's some, um, and I'm not all that religious, so, but um, you, if it's beside somebody that's wealthy, that's come from out of state, um, that owns a big house, and they want a protection next to their, um, none of us can afford it. Well, and we'll speak to the affordability option and some of the ways that that helps some of those situations of escalating farm values and real estate values and some ways that it doesn't quite get there. Um, we were just talking about small and large farmers and beginning farmers and just some of the ways we're starting to think about, you know, I think a lot of what we wanted to show today was like, here's the tools we're using now. There are multiple because there are multiple ways to get at the problem and to solve some of the challenges. And we're also learning over this 20 years of doing this where we need to add tools or iterate on those tools because they're not quite getting there um, as we try to disrupt you know the forces that are working against really um, farmland affordability uh, for all the reasons you know all the examples that have already been, been given so we're going to launch into a couple and i think um, this uh, this first example um, i do want to say that we chose some examples today that are What's great about them is they are real time in that these are like this year's VHCB investments of dollars. It means that some of them have not fully like crossed the closing line. And so we're always sensitive to, to that and recognizing that some, these projects are still kind of working their way through. But it, it is a great opportunity to talk about some, some really great examples of our key tools and that are showing you right now what the legislature has invested in um, in terms of moving forward. So this first example is in that bucket of using the sale of a conservation easement um, timed to create a transfer and access opportunity. So Mike and Tom Odette, Odette have owned in multiple generations um, a Ledge Haven Farm in Orwell. Um, uh, Jonathan Lucas has been renting the farm for about six years and the timing is, is finally right for a transfer of the farm and um, in this situation where the conservation is you know um, Senator Starr you asked about like what do, what do people need yeah. you know in, in, in this case it's typically the outgoing landowners the outgoing farmers need to be made whole for the value of the property and um, what the sale of an easement at the time of, con of, of transfer does is it really brings that full purchase price from two from two places there's the conservation easement uh, purchase that's timed with that sale of the farm that brings the development rights value, which means that the incoming farmer does not need to finance the full value. He's really in that bar graph showed it was a great example. It really needs to finance that underlying conserved value, and so they need to find the financing um, and the support to to, um, to bring that to the table. And then often these are simultaneous closings or right one on top of the other. Um, and I think that this example. Um, this is a great conservation opportunity. It is um, almost 400 acres in a block of growing conserved farmland, also um, a, adjacent to um, ecologically important lands that the Nature Conservancy and Vermont Fish and Wildlife have protected. So it's growing a block right near um, 
near Lake Champlain includes important tributaries to East Creek and the opportunity to buffer, um, buffer those waters as well as wetlands, and there's also archaeological significance on parts of the farm. So standing alone, it's an awesome farmland conservation opportunity. Together with the transfer, it's a really awesome outcome. Um, 250 cow dairy uh, to be able to um, have that farm stay as, a, um, as an owner-operated um, 250 cow dairy. And I don't know all the business terms between Mr. Lucas and the Audettes, but I do know Mike Audette's song. And I know Mike. And I, I would guess that the, the business arrangements over the, these last six years were such that Mr. Lucas could build equity. And, you know, so though it's not a family transfer, and I, I'm not going to say they're making a bargain sale, but they had an arrangement that allowed Mr. Lucas to become in this position of development things to have it happen. That's, e that's maybe easier when it's a family situation, but we have seen a huge amount of generosity from farmers even when it's not a family situation over the years. And my guess is that it was a favorable lease and that this is an outcome that Dent Brothers wanted very much for a long period of time. And we're hoping it would work out. Yeah, they didn't know that one. So, was that a family case. member? No, no, it's not. No. This is not. This is not yeah. a family member. Um, and I think what's significant there yeah. is that John John has been there for six years. So having that opportunity to build some equity, to build cow ownership, you know, to, to that that isn't can be an easier situation than yeah, a farm is suddenly on the market and someone needs to act quickly. Um, and so we have been in conversation with them for years. Alan Carnats our long time. Um, farm project director uh, in the Champlain Valley, um, well aware um, and known the Audettes for a very long time, um, and uh, it's it's exciting to be. This will be closing later this fall, uh, but really exciting that all the pieces have come together. Uh, the availability of conservation dollars, the willing seller and willing buyer, um, and uh, yeah. So yeah, you buy a 250 cal 400 acre farm. You're talking some serious yeah. money. Mm -hmm. um, so this is in, we, we had a couple slides about the, the option to purchase at ag value. Gus did a really great job of kind of set, I think, setting up that tool, which is now in, um, you know, has, starting in about 2004, was really started to be added and replacing the right of first refusal that had been historically retained at the time of, of farmland conservation. Um, in VLT's, um, conservation portfolio, um, at this point, 556 farms include the option to purchase at ag value. So that's an important number to remember for like, the next set of, uh, the next example, because it means about half the conserved farm portfolio includes the option. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was first used in Massachusetts as they started to, start to see estate buyers out competing farmers for land um, in the 1990s, and then was adapted um, and brought to Vermont and incorporated. And I, I remember um, no one knew if, if farmers would accept this tool, and um, there was a lot of trepidation, and it was it was largely accepted. One, it, it brings additional value to the conservation, but also, as, as a bottom line, farmers really embraced the idea of seeing Farmland's Day in farm ownership and having um, a, a tool to help do that. And I think um, the way we think about it is that uh, the OPAB really encourages a limited free market. It's really a free market for the farm community um, and trying to disrupt those um, non-farm buyers um, from um, having um, having the opportunity to buy the farms with this deep state investment in conservation. Um, just a few kind of nuts and bolts about how the option works. Um, it is not triggered by a sale to a family member or to a farmer. In, and so the Vermont Land Trust, the HCB, we only have the opportunity to um, consider exercising the option um, if it's a non-farm buyer. And, and for the purposes of the legal document and that bar of what is a farmer, it's, it's determined one of two ways. Um, anyone who's a qualified farmer, which means they, they meet the IRS definition of a farmer, which is that they make half of their gross income from farming, are just automatically exempt from the option. So it's not triggered. And any family to family sale is not triggered either. If the buyer is not a family member or a farmer, by that definition, 
then the owner um, needs to provide the purchase and sales agreement of, of an offer that's been made, and the buyer needs to produce a business plan to the easement holders so we can assess, even if they don't meet the IRS definition of a farmer, is their intention to farm the land? Do they have the supports in the background to be successful? Um, is this really a farm buyer? Um, and if so, when, then we can waive um, the option. If, it, if the buyer doesn't meet that criteria, we have the opportunity to consider um, exercising the option. And the goal of that is to um, <coughs> redirect the farm back into farm ownership. Um, so as, as an example, but just to give you an idea of how this option has played out over the last 20 years, we have only exercised the option once. It is largely a deterrent tool. It is largely meant to direct farmers um, to market their farms to farmers uh, to avoid the possibility that we will exercise because that is generally not a, a, a fun experience uh, to disrupt a sale that's already underway. And I guess I would just say before we began to use this option, we actually had three public hearings around the state with the farm community. And as you can imagine, Farmers generally express trepidation to anybody interfering with a sale. And so we came to this uh, with the idea, as we, as we worked on what the legal document would say and the policy would be, that was where we determined, okay, we should not get ourselves in the middle of a sale between two farmers. And, and I think um, that was the, that was very intentional on our part and, the, and in terms of the feedback the farm community gave us at that time that, you know, so there are people in the farm community that can out compete the young farmer for land and that, it, what I meant is it, it's a continuing problem, but that was the feedback we got from the community was please don't interfere in sales from farmers to farmers. Right, and because um, farmers with this restriction in their easement generally are marketing their farms to other farmers. Um, we, have yet, again, have only had to exercise once. We've provided three notices of, of the potential that we'll exercise, and those, in other cases, have redirected back into the farm community. We've waived the, the option um, over 200 times. So that's an example of, of a buyer that comes that may not meet that IRS definition of farmer because they're new and beginning, because they just don't have that track record yet, but they have the supports, they're involved with the Farm and Forest Viability Program, they have farm experience, um, and they're, and then we, we waive the option um, to enable them to, to buy the farm. Um, so. <clears throat> and so, in, yeah, so for the example, do you want me to walk through that? You want to hit your, so, so, the option um, is set up that um, the far, a farm, the, a base value of the farm as, a, as agricultural land is set in the conservation easement from the original appraisal when the development rights were purchased. The appraiser sets what that value is based on comparable sales. And if we were to exercise, it's that number plus a factor for inflation plus the value of any buildings that have been built since um, since conservation. So this example, a farmer you know, bought it for 200, they um, got it under contract for 410, but 315 was actually the agricultural value at the time, and so we have the ability to exercise at that 315, and that would be the price that the successor farmer that we would recruit would pay. So it's again, <coughs> trying, to, trying to bring the price down from the non-farm sale. How many years, uh when the farmer acquired the farm, three years. This is just like a round numbers example. I don't, I don't know what. Um, in in this one case, it was probably five to six years. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, About yeah. a short period of time. It can be, can be depending on the the market. Yeah. <laughs> well, what um, I was getting yeah. at is they made a living, must mm -hmm. be from that farm. But they also gained uh, net yeah. 115,000 over right. that right. Uh, right. six or eight or even mm -hmm. if it was 10 years, mm -hmm. you know they made 10, 15,000 a year just on 
Right. Well, and some of that could be the value of improvements as well. So one of the key things is to recognize that if farmers invested in in infrastructure, that that is part of the resale value of the of the property, um, because that is the hard cost of being being passed on. Um, so yeah, just wanted to give a little background on 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 the option to purchase that value. So we I noted that about half of the conserved farms in the state at this point have that option embedded in their conservation easement because we started to add it in 2004. Uh, about half don't, though. And so another really important tool, and, and Gus mentioned this, is the purchase of that affordability option at, at the time of a, of a transfer from a farm that was conserved years prior. So um, this, this example is, um, Woods Market Garden on Route 7 in Brandon. And what's fun about um, talking about this um, this example, um, this current project, is that this is really Farmland Access 2.0. Um, the, the purchase of this farm in 2000 by John Satz from former representative Robert Wood and his wife Sally um, was, if we talk about 115 farm transfers we supported, that's probably number one or two in our in our tally, it was one of our first farm and access projects and really gave birth to a, a, a much more robust program of teaming up uh, conservation easement purchases and, and farm transfers. So John Satz bought the farm, um, used conservation proceeds um, to make the farm affordable, spent 20 years building a really vibrant business and a beautiful family there. Um, he sadly passed away in 2021 um, of cancer, and um, his widow, Courtney, um, decided that she couldn't maintain the farm. Um, and it was a second opportunity for us collectively, Vermont Land Trust, VHCB, to work um, on finding the next um, opportunity for that farm. Um, and so the, the purchase of a retro OPAV, um, so adding that affordability option, was teamed up with, John had actually bought 65 additional acres after conservation, so he bought 80, 82 acres in 2000, he'd added 65 and had not conserved them. So we were able to buy a kind of well, fund, and we haven't quite closed yet, but purchase an easement on 65 acres, purchase affordability on the whole, um, and that dramatically brought down the purchase price for, um, the new farmers who are now on the farm and continuing what has been a very long legacy of a well-loved um, and successful farm business. Um, the purchase of retro OPAS is a really critical tool. We're doing two to three a year. Really appreciate BHCB support and the setting aside of funds for this really important um, piece of the land access toolbox. Um, it's also an opportunity to look back at older conservation easements that were developed at a time where the focus on water quality was different. The set of tools in our easements to, to address water quality concerns were different. And so what we do when we go back to an older easement to add affordability, we also take a new look at water quality protection opportunities, add buffers to streams, add wetland protection, um, so we're not only helping, again, to bridge these transfers and, and make them more affordable, but we're also strengthening the overall conservation outcomes, um, and that's very much the case here. There's a, a large wetland that's being protected, some, some um, buffers that are also associated. Um, associated. <coughs> um, I don't know if there's anything to add from the liability side. I can probably <coughs> say that um, I believe Dan and Elise moved here specifically yeah. to move onto this farm. They had been living out west and were trying to move to Vermont to farm for quite some time and just weren't finding the right piece of land to meet their needs. And so it's really a beautiful story of people finally finding a spot to land. Um, and the Farm Viability uh, Business Advisors were able to work with both the exiting owner, Courtney Sats, and uh, different advisors working with the entering folks to help them figure out those complex, like what does each party need to make this really work for everyone. Yeah, that <clears throat> that couldn't have been a cheap sale. Exactly, and <laughs> because of the small size of the parcel, the successful farm business, the ability to buy down some value um, and, and get real state, you know, it's a great state investment. It's affordability for the future, it's water quality protections, and it's bringing new farmers on, onto land, so. Um, 
and just for the old folks in the room who worked with Representative Wood, um, you may remember that when he became chair of the Institutions Committee, we had a colorful, very colorful speaker of the House uh, who made conservation a priority, which was not Representative Wood's priority at all. Um, and and um, we actually, in, we held a board meeting in Brandon one year, and my board chair invited Bob to come to the meeting and said, you know, is there anything we, our staff isn't giving, do you need more information? And Bob said, our problem's not your staff. Our problem's your philosophy. <laughs> and when we did the conservation deal, um, Bob did not sell development rights. Uh, he sold to the Satzes at fair market value, and simultaneously the Satzes sold us a conservation easement. But um, about two years after the sale, I was in the state house, and I said, Bob, how are the young people doing? And he said, I just wish they'd let me help them more. So I think he'd be happy with this outcome, though philosophically, yeah. he didn't feel like the government should spend money on this. <clears throat> um, I'd get money out of that guy. Uh, <laughs> but I think he really cared about the land. And oh, the I love that land. Work, and the people who worked that, there. Um, that, I, I, that piece of land I'm, was the world to him. Yeah. And, and I'm just saying, there was a, not just the land, but his heart went to the farmers. Yeah. Beyond that. So, anyway. So, the these couple of examples we've given of the tools, they're they're largely timed with the simultaneous sale of the farm and the conservation restrictions and the ability for a farmer, farm buyer, to you know be able to bring financing at the same time as the conservation dollars or in pretty close proximity um, to make a deal happen. Um, one of the things that we've learned over the um, last 20 years is that that isn't always the most successful way to set up a farm business for success. And some farm businesses, some farmers need a longer on-ramp to ownership, um, either to put together the equity, build the equity they need for financing, um, develop a farm business that's really tailored to the particular piece of land, um, and that these simultaneous transfers, um, while it's still a lot of what we support and do, aren't always possible. And if we really want to serve the full breadth of interesting and exciting opportunities for farmland access, having longer um, on ranch for farmers is, um, is needed. And so one of the things that Vermont Land Trust has done we have, we've always used interim farm ownership and interim land ownership as a tool in our box. It's, it's been a pretty small tool. It's been a pretty hit or miss, like case by case um, situation. And often when we did it in the past, we had, we, we had to have the end game in mind. And if we owned it, it was, we were gonna get out as soon as possible. We were gonna get out as soon as conservation dollars became available. Um, we've always believed in private land ownership as a really key um, stewardship goal. Um, and strategy in Vermont. Uh, but we have been building the Farmland Futures Fund with the intention of staying in longer in some properties in order to um, support um, the next generation of farm ownership, um, thinking, you know, focused on underserved and underrepresented farmers, opportunities to expand water quality improvements during our ownership, um, and also to, to help um, the farm community develops some new and interesting ways to own land um, in, in collective ways. At this point, we've, um, and for us, the lo having low cost capital in order to do that and to, to bridge and have a longer term ownership, in some cases up to five years, uh, was really important. And so have developed an evolving <coughs> set of, of um, funds, about 10 million, um, through the uh, state's clean water um, state revolving fund. Uh, five million that Senator Leahy um, um, got through got for us through USDA Rural Development or NRCS, excuse me, um, and another two million from the Vermont Community Foundation and High Meadows Fund. Um, right now we own ten farms, um, and as 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 farms go out of our ownership and into farmer ownership, more farms will come into our ownership. And what we do is we lease those farms um, at affordable leases. We um, focus on the wraparound services that are so critical, 
um, and then time the sale out really to meet the needs of the farmer um, in particular. Um, and um, this example is, um, is one that's underway right now. BLT currently owns this farm. Um, it's 34 acres in Barrie. Um, that is leased to Matt Sisto and Kim Rich. Um, it's going to be added to their 12-acre home farm, very successful, um, small organic vegetable operation and eggs. Um, they could not, th this is one of those situations where the sellers could not wait for conservation. The buyers could not bring the full financing without the conservation e easement sale timing. VLT was willing and able, because of the Farmland Futures Fund and, and the work we're doing to really develop that program more robustly, to serve in this interim ownership role. Um, we have done, um, so the picture on the left there is a large riparian buffer planting that happened last spring. So we're doing the work during our ownership to really establish um, trees and shrubs in the buffer so that the farm, as it moves back into private ownership, has water quality protections in place. Um, develop a lease that um, Matt and Kim can work with, and then um, we'll time the sale out with the conservation so proceeds. Putting trees in there. Mm -hmm. That was a big volunteer day. We had folks from some a whole bunch of volunteers. It was a really fun fun day last spring. Um, this is also a farm that uh, we are undergoing a new program at USDA NRCS um, called the Buy Protect, Protect Sell Program. Um, we don't always like to be the first in the country to try things with federal money, but we keep finding ourselves doing it, and we are in this case, and it's um, it's painful. It's painful, but I think also uh, we're helping lead the way to find the find the challenges in that funding and give real direct feedback to the farm bill work that's underway about how to improve that program. So we're trying to buffer the farmers from the pain pain points. We're trying to um, help the rest of the country hopefully benefit from the experience, um, and we are. At the least, heartened that the that USDA and RCS thinks that buy, protect, sell these these interim transitional ownership situations are worth um, conservation dollars and um, calling out. Um, I'll just add that this Old Hill Farm is another example of where we where uh, the Farm Forest Viability Program worked with them simultaneously to all of this um, so we started working with them a couple of years ago when they were still just on their initial 12 acre farm which I think only had about an acre for vegetable yep. production um, their ultimate goal was to grow so that both of them could be farming full-time um, and so this property will get them closer to that goal um, we ran a bunch of different financial scenarios figured out for what could they afford um, how are they going to scale up to support two people full-time making a living? Um, we also have a small program, um, a small subset of our program where we make grants to help people implement their business plans. So folks who have recently been through the planning process and identified some really key investments that need to get made, um, BHCB will do up to $10,000 for a small infrastructure equipment. <coughs> um, uh, project so they uh, last year got ten thousand dollars to help improve their barn, which is where the farm stand is, um, and currently that's in the works and looking really good. Is that <coughs> you're referring to the twelve acre farm, veggie farm? This is no, is it's that four acres. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, yeah, <laughs> the whole farm's on twelve acres, and then the thirty four is adding to it. It's and just it's, it's J Street, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a great opportunity. Um, I think um, I think the one other uh, piece to hit on on, on this um, this area where BLT is serving in longer term ownership, it's also allowing us um, to create pathways for some some new and different tools, creative lease arrangements that are performance based that um, look at um, not just the financial you know viability of the farm, but but ways to build uh, build soil to protect water and really value those things um, in, in, a, in a way that helps farmers to affordably get on land um, and create the conditions for, for better, you know, better outcomes. Also creative land holding models um, and affordability tools. So just a quick example, um, 
This farm um, was the former Chapman farm. It was actually conserved as a working dairy farm in 2017, and it was a farm transfer opportunity where a sale of an easement made um, the farmers there able to um, affordably um, own the property. Um, unfortunately, they um, did not make it as a farm and decided to sell and, and get out of dairying. Um, what emerged was this really interesting um, collective of farmers and community members who approached the, set, the, the Chapman family, but also Vermont Land Trust, with an idea to try to build a community land trust model and collective ownership. I don't know if you've heard of Agrarian Commons, that's another entity working on these collective ownership alternative tenure models where there is not one person owning a farm, but it's a larger group, and um, it allows um, it allows for a you know a, a collective um, ownership. So Vermont Land Trust owns this farm. Um, it um, and are working with. We bought the farm in 2021, and we're working with um, the White River Land Collaborative to support the what they're doing around developing their their ownership model developing their collective of farmers who are on using the different parts of the property. Um, they're also working with the local Abenaki community on an adjacent forest that's part of the farm. Um, and, um, and then the fundraising to eventually move the property into, into their ownership. And um, I think what's, what's key here is um, really supporting farmers who want to explore and pursue different ways to approach land ownership and giving time for that to and getting this land off because it went on the market in 2021, which was right at the time where their Vermont suddenly became a really desirable place uh, for people to come. And so um, us stepping in built, built that time. Yeah, <clears throat> is that, so you've only had one year then? A couple of years, yeah. So, so um, we have a lease arrangement with White River Land Collaborative and sort of a, a ramp for them to, to eventually transfer the farm and really moving some of you moving at their pace, um, and that's what some of these longer term ownerships are, is moving at the pace that's needed um, for success. So you see that as a working, is it gonna work out, or is it still kind of new to judge that? I think, um, I think we're optimistic. I think you're seeing models like this built across the other parts of the country. Agrarian Trust is a great example. Um, we're also working with Bread and Butter Farm on some work they're doing around these sorts of models, also similarly owning some land up in South Burlington. I, I, I think you can't go into this unless you're optimistic. <laughs> not, not every yeah. venture is going to be successful. No, just like, you know, the Intervale's had people who have succeeded wildly at the Intervale, and they've also had people who said, this isn't for me. So. Whenever a group of people need to get together and figure out how they're going to work together, yeah. you know, you know we had a young that, woman, that's, that's a challenge. We had a group of people in last week, I think it was one day, and we had a young woman saying how she just loved to get into farming, but couldn't make it because she wasn't a previous farmer. Well. We sort of knew that that wasn't quite accurate, uh, but I can see where something like this, uh, a young person that has no experience could have a plot of land that maybe next to somebody that has real experience that they could learn from that maybe could be successful. Yeah, the incubator farm model, I mean, think the Intervale is a great example, and I, these, um, Vermont, we're just really interested in supporting the explorations into these models because, as we know, there's no one-size-fits-all. We are up against prevailing forces that are challenging, and so innovating and iterating and um, is, is sort of where it's at right now, um, knowing, I think Gus, you said it well, not everything will succeed, but we won't know till some things get tried. And just wanted to clarify one other thing is um, like more and more we're just seeing the price points of unconserved farms being wildly unattainable for beginning farmers. So I think that sort of highlights the need to keep innovating and exploring different models within conservation because 
if conserved farms are going to be the main place of viability for beginning farmers, we need to be able to look at different options and um, try, try new things. See, I think existing conserved farms are out of the reach um, in many cases. Sometimes. Sometimes they can be, which you is, You know, I yeah. think we've got a better chance if you're starting out new and buying um, um, the rights and, and packaging something together now than, um, than the stuff that we have conserved. Some of it, and some of it's going back and doing those retroactive affordability purchases mm -hmm. because they're bringing more farms up out of that portfolio into, into the, at least the farmer to farmer sales. Yeah, I, and, and a lot of the farm, farmland I'm seeing in my community is going to existing farmers, but it's going to large farmers. Yeah, those guys, I know up north, some of the big ones are buying up a lot of, well, they're expanding their operation because there's more, in some cases, more family members joining the, the operation. And, um, yeah, it, but that seems to, I think, work without you folks. Yeah. Well, well I, I think you will find, and I think this is one thing Senator Westman is saying, is that sometimes large farms are buying conserved land. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, we've worked with Fairmont on a number of occasions now. One of the things I heard Richard Paul say at a community meeting when he was buying another piece of land in East Montpelier and somebody was just being critical about large farms, he was saying, well, this is its own 200 acre parcel. Fairmont's going to own it for the next 20 years, but then it may be a 200 acre farm again. So, um, one of the things you did a few years back um, that we didn't succeed at was, and I think this, we'll need to come back to this at some point, is you passed legislation through the Senate that died in the House that allowed for easement amendments. And while I think permanent easements are a good idea, the perpetuity is a really long time. And so there are some large farm ownerships in the big farm counties, you know, where we can serve 500 acres, it's all under one easement. And farms are doing two things right now. They're either getting bigger or they're getting smaller. And we may want a tool that's gonna to allow us to take some of those larger ownerships and break it into smaller ownerships. And that's gonna require easement amendments, which yeah. are really hard to do. So yeah, that's gonna take a lot to, yep. So the big guys can chop it down to smaller parts. It's going to take a lot of money because most of them are, or a lot of them are carrying a lot of paper. Yeah. No? So, wow. we really appreciate your time. <laughs> wow. Well, we're happy to answer more yeah. questions either in these chairs or in other conversations. Um, yeah. Um, well, you've always been very good. Uh, work with and basically easy to work with compared to some of our projects and uh, so it's great to have you in and, and we really appreciate your time and efforts and uh, we'll uh, we got another project that we're in the work on and but we'll see how okay. how that all works out and uh, you know, if we can be of assistance, uh, you know where to find us. So, and we, and we will, especially as you move to your uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. We only like this when we got money. <laughs> we, get, we get down the other room. <laughs>